I was saying last week on the Feast of the Holy Trinity that both that feast and today's feast of Corpus Christi were not celebrated in the first thousand years of our tradition. The reason being that, as I put it, you know, it's the ocean we're swimming in. We're living in the Trinity. You don't stand apart and make a feast out of it. The same thing with the Eucharist, with the body of Christ. We're, we're it. You can't stand back and make a feast out of it, except that we did. And maybe it's a good, well, obviously it's a good idea. We've been doing it for now almost, not quite a thousand years. Thomas Aquinas, as you may know, is the one in the 13th century who composed many of the hymns and, and the office that we've even been using at this mass. But let us look a little more closely at this. Uh, last Lent in 2020, I, I gave, just before COVID, I gave a series of conferences on, on Richard Rohr's, uh, Father Richard Rohr's book, The Universal Christ, and he has a beautiful, beautiful uh, chapter on the Eucharist, uh, and I'll be inspired by uh, that uh, in large measure tonight. Uh, you can also go back and look at my lecture on the chapter in more detail. But, you know, as we see in the readings today, uh, it's largely focused on the sacrifice of Christ. You know, the Passover lamb, and, but the Passover lamb starts by being eaten. You know, and a lot of our devotion, especially today, you know, is focused on the mass as the holy sacrifice of the mass, etc., uh, on, on the sacrifice that we are called to give. Uh, but I really, really believe that that's putting the cart before the horse at the very least. You don't start with that. How can you start with that? You've got to start with, with the banquet, the meal, as we see in the Last Supper, precisely. And you have to start with, with that, that exchange, that, that intimacy. And it's not just a banquet, it's a, it's a wedding banquet of the Lord with his people. And the, the, the messianic times and the parables often describe, you know, the, the banquet of heaven and the, the bride coming down from heaven in the book of Revelation. We have to begin first by experiencing the intimacy and the intensity of that intimacy with Christ. That has to be the inspiration and the the substance of, of our experience hmm? and what inspires us. Hmm? And as Richard Rohr remarks, Jesus didn't say, you know, this is my divinity. The Council of Trent pointed out, of course, that if we get the body of Christ, we get the whole Christ, including his divinity. But Christ didn't say that. He put the emphasis elsewhere. This is my body. My body. And of course, eat my flesh, drink my blood. I mean, that's scandalous, it's shocking, it's cannibalistic, it's vampiric. What are we talking about here? As you know, when he gave the discourse about, you know, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink, in John 6, you know, people walked away. They said, this guy's crazy. We can't listen to this. And maybe we've gotten too used to it. What, what is the point? Well, Jesus himself explains in John, John 6, no, the flesh profits nothing. The words I'm speaking to you are spirit and life. Because the body that, of course, we share with in Christ is his resurrected body, the spiritualized body. But it's nonetheless body. And when you, Jesus comes and offers us his body, that sounds like a marriage, right? We become one body with Christ. Sounds like a marriage to me. Why don't we experience the intensity and the intimacy of that? Jesus comes to make love. That's what he's doing in the Eucharist with us and with his whole people. We become literally one body. And yes, if you will, Paul says to the Corinthians, whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Yes, spirit and life. The spirit is there. The spirit penetrates us and the Lord and, and everything and makes us well, feel, feel and experience that intimacy with the Lord. And that he gives it to us as, he gives his body to us as nourishment. And again, it's, it's a way of reminding us that this is not exterior to us. It's so intimate that we eat it. 
And Jesus said, eat it. He didn't say stare at it, which is okay, but it has to lead to the eating, to make it part of us, and we're part of him. We're one body with him. Just like the food we eat become one's body with us. That's the intensity and the intimacy. But the special blessing that we offered in the Eucharist and the special presence of Christ that we rightly cherish in the Eucharist is also to remind us, as Paul says about Christ's resurrected body, it's the whole universe. So we can find it in the, in the appearances of bread and wine. It's also a reminder to be able to be nourished by it and find it everywhere. The church is the body of him who fills the universe in all its parts, who fills all in all. Christ is all in all, as Paul says to the Ephesians and the Colossians. So it's a reminder, not that this is some extra special case. It is a special case, but it's, it's there to remind us that, look, every, everywhere is the body of Christ. And certainly everybody, everybody, is the body of Christ. That's the whole point that we, as Paul makes very clear, we share one, bo- one bread, we break the one bread, and there, therefore we are one body. We, sh- we become one body by sharing Christ's body. We all become the body of Christ. So everything and everyone really is the body of Christ. So there's the intensity and the intimacy, then that's extended to the whole universe and extended to one another. There has to be an intense, intimate relationship of friendship and and community and fellowship uh, with one another because we are literally, literally one body in Christ. That's what really has to penetrate our consciousness and our awareness and our experience so that we can realize how closely joined and intimately connected, how intensely related, We all are to Christ and to one another and to the whole planet and to the whole universe. You don't just go to communion to get extra merit or to offer some sacrifice to the Lord. You do it because we're all called to be one. Jesus' final prayer in John's Gospel, that all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they may be in us, that they may become perfectly one. Or as he says again in John 6, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Not looking out at each other, but in. This is the kind of intense loving experience that should be ours constantly. And then follows the sacrifice. When you were one with everyone and everything, just as Christ gives himself as nourishment, he pours out his own blood, yes, literally, for us to drink under the appearance of intoxicating wine. So then we are called, likewise, to pour ourselves out in love and sacrifice for one another. But you don't start with that. You start with the union and the communion with him and with one another, and then you organically and spontaneously are inspired joyfully to pour yourself out likewise for everyone else who's one body with you anyway. So how can you not want to care for your own body? As Paul says to the Corinthians, if one member suffers, if one member rejoices, everybody does because you are one body. So you want to give yourself as Christ gives himself to you, to give yourself to his body, to one another, because you are literally one, one body. The universe, as Richard says, is is the body of God, both in its essence and in its suffering. So the blood, yes, is Christ's blood poured out. And the blood of so many people poured out all through the centuries, all through our own time, so much blood poured out. And that's also the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Whose else would it be if Christ is all in all? So we're united with the suffering, yes, and the here, very traditional, but it's, very, but it's stemming from this union that we share one blood already, and if Christ's blood is poured out and our fellow human being's blood is poured out constantly, we must pour out our life blood in sacrifice and communion with them to do all we can to bring life. Blood is also the life force. So it's not just poured out, but it's poured in and new life and new hope is given to us and to all. 
So the intensity, the intimacy, and another I-N, inclusivity. Everything and everyone is included in this body of Christ. And that should inspire us to even greater intimacy and love and sacrifice, yes, uh, in and with Christ. You know, and one final point here, another, another N-I-N-T, it's, this is an integral mystery. You know, the gift of understanding, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, traditionally has been meant that you get to see the connection of everything in our, in our faith. Well, you, I've been talking about connection all through here. But it's also saying the incarnation leads to the res- resurrection. The resurrection is not some afterthought or some proof of Jesus' divinity. Once divine life enters into human life, human life enters into divine life, and the resurrection is inevitable and organic. And the Eucharist is part of that. It's the fulfillment of the incarnation, the fulfillment of the resurrection, the continuation of it. The fact that it actually comes to us as food is a... (laughs) if I may be forgiven this little irreverence, it's a stroke of genius on Jesus' part. <laughs> of course, it's way more than that. But it's, it's a way of reminding us that we are so intimately connected that we're nourishment for one another, that we need to feed one another as, as God feeds us constantly in one body. Nourish our own body because it is our own body. Take care of the environment because it's our body and it's Christ's body. How can we not? Very contemporary, finally, eh? But that's just the logical, direct consequence of these truths and these lived realities. hmm? So please, let's stop seeing the sacrament, the host, as something separate. As soon as you're talking about separate, you're missing the point. Everything about life, everything about God, everything about Christianity, everything about any spirituality is about connection and all being one. And the Eucharist is there to remind us that we are one, to help us become one more deeply, intensely, and intimately than ever before.